Hello, I'm Jan Newharth, Chair and Chief Executive Officer of the Freedom Forum. Welcome to day two of the Free Expression Festival, a series of programs leading up to Thursday's Free Expression Awards, an annual event where the Freedom Forum recognizes individuals for their courageous acts of free and fearless expression. The festival features honorees, presenters, and guest speakers talking about the importance of the First Amendment in their work. Today, we feature activist and author DeRay McKesson, who talks about his civil rights activism and how the First Amendment plays a role in his work. DeRay is a 2021 Free Expression Award honoree. This program is brought to you by the Freedom Forum, which fosters First Amendment freedoms for all. Our vision is an America where everyone knows, understands, values, and defends the freedoms of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. Today's festival program was also made possible with generous support from Salesforce. And now please welcome our moderator, Aaron Morrison, a national race and ethnicity writer for the Associated Press. Aaron is also an alumnus of the Freedom Forum's Chips Quinn Scholars Program for Diversity in Journalism. Welcome to the Free Expression Festival. I'm Aaron Morrison, National Race and Ethnicity Writer for the Associated Press. We are joined by civil rights activist and educator, DeRay McKesson, who is being honored this Thursday at the Freedom Forum's sixth annual Free Expression Awards, which honors individuals for their courageous acts of free and fearless expression. But before we talk to the honoree, let me tell you a little bit about him. DeRay is a co-founder of Campaign Zero, an organization dedicated to ending police and state violence in America. He is the author of the critically acclaimed book, On the Other Side of Freedom, The Case for Hope, and host of the award-winning weekly podcast, Pod Save the People. In 2015, DeRay was named one of Fortune Magazine's World's 50 Greatest Leaders and was awarded the Peter Jennings Award for Civic Leadership. In 2016, President Obama praised McKesson for his outstanding work and he was named one of the 30 most influential people on the internet by Time Magazine. So DeRay, welcome, and congratulations on the Free Expression Award. It's an honor to be here. So let's get into the conversation. Um, the Freedom Forum's mission is to foster First Amendment freedoms to all. Uh, what are your thoughts on the First Amendment and its connection to you know, the, the early days of the Civil Rights Movement and to today's movement? Yeah, you know, I know this all too well, unfortunately, because when I was arrested in Baton Rouge, I got sued by a police officer who said that he got hit with a rock and I caused it. And we were in litigation for roughly five years, went to the Supreme Court, we won at the Supreme Court, but it was all about the First Amendment. It was all about the right to protest and free speech and what that meant. And there's a seminal case that essentially declares the right to, pro to protest, which is the Claiborne case. And that came out of the civil rights movement. And the case that I was involved in is only the second time uh, that the right to protest has really come up to the Supreme Court in this context. So, you know, I see the chilling effect that when people clamp down on free speech, I see what it does to protest. I see how the police try to use uh, this idea that people don't have the right to speak in public as a way to chill any dissent. So, you know, I think that the First Amendment, the right to free speech is one of the most important guarantees that we can that we can have in a, in a civil society. Uh, and I worry that in moments like this, especially with the Internet, that like we're chipping away at that ever so gently. Right. Um, how does the First Amendment guide your work today? You know, I've always thought about protests as that is telling the truth in public. Like that's what we did, right? In 2014, we we use our bodies to tell the truth that Mike Brown should be alive. Like that was what we did. It, it's what people continue to do all across the country. And if we're not able to tell those truths, then people will literally act like the things aren't happening. If we hadn't shut down streets, if we hadn't tweeted, if we hadn't had videos go viral, people would have been like, yeah, those they're making it up. It was telling the truth in public that changed so much of the narrative and helped people to see a problem that they would otherwise have no have ignored. So, you know, it is key to our work. I don't know how we do this work around justice, if not for the protections of the First Amendment. Right. Um, can you talk about some of the ways, not just with the lawsuit that that was filed against you, but uh, certainly some of the ways that that lawmakers around the country 
are trying to to essentially make it more difficult. They're trying to put a chilling effect, uh, a chilling effect on the the expression of folks, particularly those who have been protesting in the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah, you know, I'll zoom out a little bit and just remind people uh, that you think about 2020 is that the police actually killed more people in 2020 than every single year that we have data for, except for 2018. So there's this idea that like 2020 was a banner year, things got better, all this conversation. And like, I'm mindful that symbolic change and narrative change is important, uh, doesn't always equal to outcome change. So that's like the veneer. The police sort of understand, though, that like the more and more that people tell the truth, like the more and more scrutiny the institution comes under. It's why you see in 2021, a set of laws being introduced across the country that would make it harder to legally film the police that would criminalize, you know, being outside late at night, like a, a new spin on curfew laws that would essentially criminalize protests. You saw the police at the end of 2020 get really aggressive with protesters who were using bullhorns, like stuff that didn't even, they couldn't even make an argument about violence, but it was sort of an annoyance to the police. And they were just being really aggressive. Or you think about the case with the old white guy who got pushed down by the police on camera and those officers weren't disciplined. So you see an infrastructure both being like solidified and, and sort of built across the country that will protect the police at all costs. And that is really dangerous. And even when you think about accountability for the police, remember that the police kill about 1100 people a year. The highest number of convictions ever is 11. So it's like, you know, the police are clamping down because they don't want any change to happen and they're criminalizing protest, even in this moment where they know they're not held accountable. Right. Um, you know, I, I think when people hear you talk about these subjects, um, they'll probably be surprised and, or even impressed at the, the level of knowledge that you have around these 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 subjects, these these laws that are popping up all over the country. And I think that's because, you know, Campaign Zero really does a lot of that um, sort of aggregating uh, the laws that exist around the country that, uh, you know, that are related to, to law enforcement and, and even to um, uh, how the community, uh, you know, interacts and, and you know, has control uh, or no control over uh, the police. So uh, can you tell me about Campaign Zero? and how it started and um, what its ultimate goal is. Yeah, so, you know, I was one of the original protesters in the street in 2014 in St. Louis and Ferguson. Uh, and once the protests sort of slowed down from being day to day, we were trying to figure out, well, what's the, how do we fix this across the country? What is the fix? So we called it Campaign Zero because we believe that we can live in a world where the police don't kill people. We can live in a world uh, that it understands safety beyond police. And we are engaged every day in the question of how. So like we get, we believe in abolition. We completely think that we can understand safety that doesn't uh, need police. But we're like, how do you get there? Like, how do you build the bridge? So we spent years trying to figure out like, what are the building blocks of the infrastructure and institution of policing? So we manage the only database of police union contracts in the country, an officer bill of rights. We manage the only database of use of force policies. We lead the work around banning no-knock raids across the country. We're doing all these projects that are structural in their essence, because we think that's the only way that you actually change the outcomes. And we manage the most comprehensive database of police violence in the U.S. because we realized in 2014 is that we didn't know, right? Like we didn't know how widespread the problem was. We didn't know where it was. So for instance, a lot of people don't realize that the police actually kill more people in suburban communities and almost all all other communities combined, it's not cities. People think it's cities. Cities is actually the only place where, the, where police killings are decreasing. In suburban and rural communities, they're increasing. And the gap between suburban and cities is actually a, a vast gap. So we are trying to figure out how do we make sure that the solutions are in place where the problem is, and how do we safeguard the solutions when they get in, in place so that they last? Right. Um, you know, a lot of people who, who are familiar with you will you know, we remember, remember you from the early days of the protest and, you know, the blue vest, but, you know, certainly that wasn't your first entry point into activism. Can you talk, you know, about a particular point in your life um, that you realized activism would play a major role? 
I think that teaching probably had the single biggest impact on my life. So I was a youth organizer when I was a young person. I did a lot of work in Baltimore with uh, youth groups and community groups when I was in high school. But teaching was the first time that I understood systemic change. Like before that, I knew nonprofits. In Baltimore, I knew the nonprofit world really well. I didn't have a firm grasp of structural change, but I knew what programs could do to help community and like fix gaps. But it wasn't until I taught and I was like, I get it. I see. I see what a system can do to help kids. I see what a broken system does that doesn't help kids. I'm in it. I'm a part of the system. I like saw it so clearly. And then I worked at the Harlem Children's Zone and helped to lead the largest center in the Harlem Children's Zone at 145th and Douglas. And like that too was just another reminder of like, what does it mean to operate at scale? You know, we have 500 kids a day, kid at 12. It was a massive after school and out of school operation. And just seeing like what good design looks like really changed everything for me. And then I, you know, I went to Baltimore, I went back home, opened up an after school center, trained teachers, did a lot in education, but it was education that really was like the first thing for me that helped me both understand my responsibility and then the role of systems. Right, right. How would you uh, advise people you know, particularly young people today and, and old folks too, um, who might get involved with activism. Yeah, so I'd say I've never been more hopeful that we can win and more sort of like, I believe that it is possible in a way that I, I believe before, but I like fervently believe it. And I also am worried that we might not. That like, this is a moment, you know, what happens after the protest is that the window closes. So when the protests are happening, it's a really wide window, we can press for everything. Then the window closes and closes and closes. And we're tracking all the police legislation across the country right now. And, you know, it's interesting, we're fighting some fights that frankly, if we had to fight them last summer, it would have been a year, but people are generally nervous about the police. So we need more and more people who who sort of just understand their responsibility to community to come out and press their legislators, you know, like, 20 calls, 10 emails matter a whole lot, way more than you think. The second is that nobody's figured out the solutions. Like the solution space is actually pretty, uh, it's just not full right now. There's a lot more work on the problem. So people spend a lot of work detailing how bad it is or what is bad about it. There's not as much work on the solution. So if you wanna do solution work, like just start, just start dreaming up what would it look like to keep a community safe at scale if not for this or da da da. Like we need to do that. And the third thing is that I wake up every morning chasing the question of how do we get to zero? Like that is my thing. That is like the thing that guides me. So I'd ask you like, what is the question you're chasing? Right, right. You know, a lot of people heard the phrase last year, defund the police and, you know, a lot of immediately were put off by it. Uh, they didn't understand it. They thought that, that it meant no police whatsoever, anywhere ever. Um, and um, I, I think, what I've been seeing is people trying to articulate what that looks like, what it could mean. It's not the absence of police, though there are folks out there who are abolitionists, but it's it's the proportioning the re public resources, the public dollars to where they would most help other people. Can you talk about, um, you know, where in your work you, you could see that really, uh, you know, sort of taking off? Yeah, so I'd start by saying that, like, I am never engaged in fighting people about phrases uh, that I'm most interested in, like, the idea. So part of our work as organizers is to create arm ramps uh, and entrances for people. And for some people, that's not a good entrance. For some people, that's not a good arm ramp. And, like, part of my responsibility is to figure out a better way to get you in the room. Like, I'm not fighting you about this one thing. And I think that it is sort of dangerous when we say that if you don't like the phrase and you don't care about Black people, it's like, I know a ton of Black people who like that phrase is not a, a good entrance for them. And for some people, it's a great entrance, right? So like part of our work is to figure out how do we get people in the room around this work? The second thing that I'd say is that the core idea is an idea that people already believe. That like most people believe that experts should do what experts do. So who should respond to a mental health crisis? Probably an expert. Who should respond to homelessness? Probably a social worker, probably an expert, right? Like, so that's like not a wild idea. That's not a new idea. That idea is not very controversial. And the police are actually the first people to tell us that they're over overwhelmed and overburdened. They are the first people to tell us we're not people's parents. We are not social workers. We're not doctors. They tell us that all the time. So we're like, we agree. You're right. So we should have those people respond to crisis instead of you. So the question for me is, what instances do we need somebody with a gun to respond to? I think that when you start to go down the list, it's actually a pretty tiny list of things. And that's not even what the majority of the police work that we see across the country is engaged in. So like, 
That is how I think about it. I would sort of zoom out even further and say that I don't think the question is really police or no police. I think that's a trap. I think that the question is rooted in two beliefs. One is that there will always be conflict. We can fix all the things and people will still disagree with each other. And some of that conflict will result in harm. The questions are who intervenes in conflict, who responds to harm? The police are just the easiest, simplest, laziest answer to that at scale. They're not the best. You know, we have a lot of conflict already between people where the police are not the mediators. The police are not the best version of people to respond. So the question becomes, how do we scale that? All right. All right. Um, you know, of course, you know better than most that, you know, when you all were started saying Black Lives Matter and declaring that in, out in the streets, there was this response you know, blue lives matter or all lives matter, particularly let's stay on the blue lives matter part of this. Um, how do you put what happened to you um, in context with what went down at the US Capitol on January 6th? Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, it is, I, white privilege doesn't do justice to what that was, like that we need like a better phrase to, to sort of waltz into the Capitol, put your feet up on Nancy Pelosi's desk with cameras in the middle of the day is just like a, a level of something that I don't have the words for. But I think about how like we were just armed with cell phones and the truth, that was it. I got tear gas, pepper spray, dragged by my ankle, shot at all this stuff, put in jail. And like, we had the truth in a cell phone. Like that was, that was what we had. These people had legitimate weapons. These people were like engaged in actual malice. Uh, and it was still like just a cool day in the US, right? So I think that we saw the disparity. I think the the thing that is important coming out of that is that everybody saw it. So there are people who normally would be like, well, I think you're exaggerating. It's like, no, no, I think he had his feet on Nancy Pelosi's desk. Or there are a lot of people who are like, well, no, but it was like, everybody saw that. So that like just chipped away at a whole set of people who were choosing denial. And even the Blue Lives Matter thing, people saw white supremacists kill police. Like they, that happened, right? Like people, police officers died because of the white supremacists that day. Like, you know, we didn't kill any police. So I think the, I think the important thing that came out of that is that like there were a host of people who would have refused to engage that content and they were forced to see it. Right, right. Well, um, Dere. Thank you for joining us uh, and thank you to our viewers for joining us for this program uh, as part of the Freedom Forms Free Expression Festival. Cool. It's good to be here. Honored to accept the award and, uh, and I'm hopeful that we will talk again soon. Great. Thank you for joining us today. The Free Expression Festival continues tomorrow, featuring a conversation with investigative journalist and 2021 Free Expression Power Shift Award honoree, Julie K. Brown, who talks about her coverage of the Jeffrey Epstein case. Please tune in tomorrow at 2 p.m. at freeexpressionawards.org. And you can catch up on all the Free Expression Festival programs by visiting our YouTube channel.